happy Sunday, church. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 16 this morning in 2 Corinthians 5. Acts chapter 16 uh, in 2 Corinthians 5. And I think we can even throw the text of Acts 16 up there. It's a story many of us might be familiar with. Uh, Paul and Silas are in a prison. And as they sing and pray, chains actually break in that prison. And the prisoners are set free. Um, and by the way, we picked this verse for this morning before we even sang about freedom in worship. So how many think the Holy Spirit might be speaking something to us as a church today. But before I tell the story about Paul and Silas's uh, party in the prison, I actually want to tell uh, my story about a party in the prison. Um, which I actually have, believe it or not. So I was uh, 16 years old uh, in Mexico on a mission trip with another church. And uh, it's a group of 16, 17-year-olds. And we wake up one morning, we'd slept in tents, and we're about to go out to do our ministry uh, for the day. And the, the leaders say to us, hey, uh, today you guys are going to a men's drug rehabilitation prison. And we're like 16, so we're like, Awesome. And they're like, yep, we're going to do it. And so we pray for that day, and we kind of ask God what he's saying about that day. And this one little, uh, tiny little girl on our team is like, I just feel like there's going to be a party at the end of the day. And we're like, we're going to a prison, girl. Like, what? Pat her on the head, and we go. And here's what we, here's what we had. We, we were doing, how many of you guys remember, like, those old-time 90s youth group skits? set to music, like with the t-shirts and like, so we had these skits we practiced where there was like the demons wore the red t-shirts and Jesus wore the white t-shirt and then Jesus with the white t-shirt dies, rises again to the dramatic music and then the demons all fall down. It's like, this is what we have. 16 year olds, colored t-shirts. Uh, so, uh, what's that band called? Skrillex? Is that the right band? Skillet? Skillet. Skillet. <laughs> In the background. And so we're 16. We walk into this room, and there's, uh, there's a ton of just honestly terrifying men sitting, arms folded, angry faces. And we do our little skit. And then for some reason, they picked me to be the one that shared the gospel message at the end. So I get up, and I share my minute and a half gospel message with my 16-year-old who's translating it into Spanish for me. And then, I mean, I just say this just to brag on God. To this day, I'm thinking back, I have no idea how, why, what happened. But we give a call for these men if they want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and all but two come down to the front. <laughs> like, I'm not saying I was awesome. Like, I'm a 16, minute and a half gospel presentation skillet. That's all it was. But then one of the Mexican uh, pastors comes and starts to lay hands and pray for these men. And God's presence comes so strong in that prison that they start to fall down in the power of God. And I start to, I ask what's happening to translate what's going on because they're starting to pray. And these men start getting delivered of demonic spirits. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, we're all just watching. And then, the, and then it goes on for a while. And then this one Mexican pastor stands up, picks up his guitar, starts to play. And the joy of the Lord starts to break out in the prison. And these men stand up and dance. And that little girl from my team is standing over on the side going, this is the party. This is the party. <laughs> How many of you know God loves to set people free who are in chains? So this is Acts chapter 16. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately, someone say immediately, all the doors of the prison were opened, everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights, uh, which would have been probably this time torches or fire. Uh, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas because he sees all the chains broken. And then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And so we're talking this morning, we're in a series about words, redefining words. And this morning, the word that I want to redefine for us is salvation. Everyone say salvation. And the paradox of salvation is this, is that Paul and Silas were in physical chains Yet they had a freedom that, those, uh, that the jailer who wasn't in chains needed. And this is the paradox of salvation. As we look at culture and as we look in this day and age, we have a freedom that we know that culture needs. But when culture looks at us, they think we're in chains of bondage and religion and all of these things. So what does it mean for us to be saved? And what does it mean for us to be truly free? Okay, so we're going to look at this this morning. Um, for those of you who, uh, who uh, care, the technical term for what we're talking about is soteriology. Okay, everyone say soteriology. And so that is from the Greek word soteria, which means salvation, and the Greek word logos, which means understanding. So when you put that together, we're talking this morning about an understanding of our salvation. And here's what I want to present to us this morning is that salvation is not a moment. It's not attending church. It's not a belief system. What salvation is, is a story. And we have a part to play in that story. Salvation is a story, and we have a part to play in that story. Let me show you what I'm talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And um, you know what? I didn't pray. I know we don't have to pray before the messages, but I just sense that God is doing something significant in our midst. So as you turn to 2 Corinthians 5, we also have it on the screen. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, we thank you uh, that you would speak to us from your word this morning. God, renew our understanding of what salvation is, what it means to be saved, what it means to be truly free in the name and authority of Jesus. Everyone said... Amen. So Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Um, Paul, 2 Corinthians is a very emotional letter with lots of brilliant uh, theological turns of phrase that Paul uses. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is actually one of my favorite uh, verses and sections in the Bible. In fact, many of us in the room, especially if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this before, um, but you probably didn't know that it's a passage about salvation. So here's what Paul says. He says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everyone say new creation. new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Just to make sure we're tracking here. Everyone say ministry of reconciliation. There we go. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to themselves. And then if we skip forward to the end of this section, uh, Paul actually quotes the book of Isaiah. And he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. And so what Paul does is he redefines salvation for the people he's writing to, not as a moment, not as attending church, not as a belief system, but as a story of creation, separation, Jesus Christ, redemption, and then becoming ministers of reconciliation. So I want to illustrate this just a little bit. Um, so I actually made a, uh, a chart because um, I, I love making charts. Just be honest. How many of you love making charts? <laughs> My poor wife. I'm so sorry. The other day we were on a date in Sacramento. And I was so excited to show her my new chart that I made. Do you remember that? And we sat down. Yeah, you loved it. <clears throat> I know. So I made a chart to illustrate this. So here, here's, here, here's, here's what I made, this little diagram here. So we have kind of this timeline here. And on this timeline, at the beginning is Genesis chapter 1, creation. How many of you have read or heard Genesis 1? In the beginning, God created. So that's creation. And then on the other side, at the end of the story, Revelation chapter 22, we have something called new creation. Okay, and uh, many of you might have heard of new creation be referred to as heaven. Uh, I, it's a longer than I have time to explain here, but what heaven actually is, and I've suggested that maybe Pastor Brandon could preach on heaven at some point in these series to redefine what heaven means according to a biblical worldview. How many of you want to hear Pastor Brandon preach on heaven? Come on, come on. I'm just, 
So uh, heaven is not necessarily a place that we go to when we die, but the Bible actually describes this picture of God redeeming and restoring earth and heaven is actually the destiny of heaven is to be on earth and so i think a better theological word for heaven would be new creation and that's where we're going does that make sense where everything's right everything's good and and so in between creation and new creation we have something called now how many of you are living in now great good we're tracking here so in between creation and new creation, we have now. And when God creates the world, what does he say that the world is? Good. It's good. He says that the world is good. So everything starts off good. But then in Genesis chapter 3, uh, something bad happens. And theologians have since called this the fall. But what ultimately happens is Adam and Eve, male and female, choose to listen to the voice of a serpent rather than the voice of God. And as a result, that goodness gets a little bit distorted and something called sin is introduced. Um, Sin is another word uh, we could redefine, and I gave that invitation to Pastor Bob to preach. How many of you want to hear Pastor Bob preach on sin? Come on. I don't know what it is. You are really good at talking about sin. I I just want to say that. I don't know what it is about. I'm serious. Okay. Uh, So sin is not just making mistakes or messing up. My, my, one of my favorite theologians, Susan Eastman, actually calls sin a cosmic innervating force that has infected all of the earth and all of humanity. Sin is less than just making mistakes and doing the wrong thing. Sin is a disease that has infected our planet and infected us that only the blood of Jesus can heal. And so that sin is more than just making mistakes. Sin infects systems and causes things like racism, injustice, poverty, Uh, All of those things. Sin is this cosmic invading force that's affected us, affected our world. Um, But part of that, too, is this enemy in the story. How many of you know good stories have villains? It would be terrible to watch a story or a movie and there's no villain. Everything's just good all the time. That would be like, I don't know. What's a story without a villain? Is there anything? Teletubbies? I don't know. There's always a villain and a good story. And the villain in this story that gets introduced is Satan. Everyone say boo. (laughs) And this might sound kind of unique to us in a Western uh, American context to talk about Satan. But here's the reality. We all face things like depression, anxiety, fear. Some of us face things like suicidal thoughts. Uh, sexual addiction. I know these are really, really heavy topics. And the reality is sometimes that stuff does come just from us and our own brokenness. But how many of you are aware that many times there's a spiritual power behind those things? And I say this this morning because I think God wants to bring some freedom to some people in the room where you've been trapped in cycles of depression, fear, anxiety, addiction. And what God wants to invite you into is knowing that he actually can set you free from that because that's not just you. That's a demonic power that's invading your thought life. I even felt very specific. I'll probably pray for this at the end, but there's somebody in here. uh, You've been rehearsing negative thoughts about yourself when you look in the mirror. And actually the voice that's in your head is not just I look, but you actually speak to yourself and you say, you look um, X, Y, Z, you look bad, you look ugly. And I would say that's that's a picture of what demonic oppression can look like. That's not you. That's Satan. And Paul says our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. And we have to have an honest conversation in a very intellectually worshiping society that there's real spiritual powers that are trying to fight us. And that's Satan. And then the other thing that gets introduced is sickness, is sickness. So before the fall, there wasn't sickness, there wasn't diabetes, there wasn't cancer, there wasn't any of these things. There was uh, complete health. Um, But then, um, in the new creation, the redeemed side of this heaven, where all this is going, uh, and that's, by the way, that second line there is the end of time, okay, the end of time. So someday time's going to end, the the world as we know it it is going to end, and on the other side of that line, new creation, instead of sin, there's forgiveness. 
Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, every trespass that we've trespassed is forgiven. On the other side, in the new creation, uh, instead of Satan, there is freedom. And in heaven, we are not going to walk around with sin and with those anxious, depressed, fearful, suicidal even thoughts, we're going to have real and genuine freedom. And then the other thing that's in the new creation is fullness of healing instead of sickness. Why do I say fullness of healing? Um, Because who doesn't love a good alliteration in church? Come on, somebody. (laughs) But also, because I want to capture the full essence of this, we're not just talking about physical healing, although praise the Lord in heaven, there's going to be no physical ailments, no sickness, no disease, um, but there's also going to be no emotional trauma. No PTSD, no mental illness. So when I say fullness of healing because it captures the full range of human brokenness, body, soul, and spirit. And so Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is or she is a new creation. So somehow, through Christ, we enter in to that new creation living. So everyone say, through Christ. So halfway in between creation and new creation, there was this event called the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's what happens in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That line between now and heaven gets a little blurry. It actually says when Jesus was baptized, it says the heavens were torn open. And that word for torn doesn't mean the heavens just parted for a little bit and then closed. The word for torn means the heavens were torn open in two, never to be put back together again. And all of a sudden, forgiveness invades this earth. Freedom invades this earth. Fullness of healing invades this earth. And so that's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, through Christ, this veil, Pastor Brandon even read it in worship this morning, this veil between us and heaven has been torn. And where there's sin, we have an opportunity to proclaim forgiveness. Where there's Satan, we have an opportunity to see demons flee. And where there's sickness, we have an opportunity to pray for fullness of healing. And this is the life that Jesus lived. Jesus walked around forgiving the sick. He walked around forgiving the sinful. He walked around uh, praying for demons to be released. He walked around praying for healing. But here's the tension of the now is somehow we're both in the now and the not yet of the kingdom. Somehow we still see evidence of sin, Satan, and sickness in our world. And the answer for this, Paul says, is for us to be an ambassador. Everyone say ambassador. So an ambassador is somebody who represents the value system and government of one country in another country. And so what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, you are a new creation. That's the country you live in. Hebrews even talks about it just like that. He says, you're a citizen of heaven. That's the country you live in. But there's an opportunity to be an ambassador representing the value system government of heaven on earth. Does that make sense? And so that's the, a lot of us with the salvation story, we stop at Jesus died for me, now I'm saved. Paul doesn't stop the salvation story there. He says from that place, we actually have an opportunity to be an ambassador and pray for the value system of heaven to invade earth. How many of you remember Jesus' prayer that we would pray that his kingdom would come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We have a responsibility. If we're saved, we have an assignment, and it's to release God's forgiveness here and now. It's to release God's freedom here and now. It's to release God's fullness of healing here and now. And sometimes, if we're honest, I just want to give language to this. It is a battle because Satan has a stranglehold on the world. We don't have time to get into the fullness of that theology. But this is our responsibility as ambassadors of Christ is to see these things break into earth. 
So Pastor Brandon shared with us last week that if this pastor thing doesn't work out for him, he's going to become a chef. How many of you remember that? He's going to be a chef. So I thought I would share for me if this pastor thing doesn't really work out. Um, this is kind of embarrassing for me to share, but I would love to be on like a clean version of SNL. I just think that would be awesome. I'm not saying I watch SNL. I just want to be on a clean version of SNL. And you might not think I'm funny, but I do. And that's what's going to make it. That's what's going to help me make it. So, uh, so when I was little, I used to do theater and improv and all these different things. And so I remember, uh, it was, this is before the days, for the, like the internet wasn't like widely used when I was 10 and 11. And so they'd post the cast list after you auditioned on the stage door of the theater. Come on, how many of you did theater when you were little? Just be honest, come on, come on. Uh, how many of you have kids that try out for plays and you just know that anticipation of like, what part, what part am I gonna get? So I used to make my mom like drive me around the door of the theater on the days that we're gonna post it just to wait to see what role I was gonna get. And you know, salvation's a story and we have a part to play in that story. But I think for a lot of us, we stop at getting our assigned part and we don't move forward to learn the lines and actually perform in the play. Some of us stop at just understanding this, understand, yes, I'm an ambassador, but we don't actually learn the lines and learn what it's going to take for us to bring heaven to earth, to see forgiveness released to people who don't know they have it, to see freedom released to those in demonic oppression, to see healing come to those who are sick. And that's the charge we have as a church. I want to invite Josiah up to the keys. I'm going to tell one last story here, and then we're going to pray. I just think there's something in the human heart that wants to be part of a story that's bigger than us. There's something in the human heart that wants to be a part of a story that's bigger than us. And I think for some of us, that's why we dress up at things like movie premieres. Come on, how many of you dressed up at a movie premiere? <laughs> Pastor Brandon, awesome. That's why our kids dress up and love to participate in stories. There's something in the human heart that says, I want my life to be about more than my nine to five job. How many of you have ever wanted that? Just be honest. I want my life to be about more than my nine to five job. This is the good news of the gospel. Friends, the good news of the gospel is not that you get to come and sit in church on a Sunday morning. The good news of the gospel is that we're sent to a lost, broken, and dying world. And that's what salvation looks like. Salvation looks like us signing up to see God's freedom invade every area of society. And it's a story that we're a part of. So I want to share, uh, we've been in a season of seeing God move and just, I mean, humbly, we've just seen God do some amazing things. We saw those two cases of cancer healed in the last couple of weeks. But really for Morgan and I, um, we got to see that season start kind of behind the scenes, under the ground. We were actually sitting right there where Pastor Bob is uh, one Sunday morning. And we got a text a few weeks ago from Emily and Gunner and Preston, our missionaries in China. How many of you know Emily, Gunner and Preston? So I feel privileged and honored to get to share this good news with you guys as a church, with us as a family. Because how many of you know when our missionaries have wins on the mission field, there are wins. It's our community on mission. It's what it looks like. So Emily and Gunnar Preston uh, had this girl named Rebecca who's been kind of orbiting into their life for actually five years now. So I actually had the privilege of meeting Rebecca uh, five years ago in 2014 in my first trip to China. And I remember we all met her for the first time. She was one of many students. And when we were leaving, she got us all these like gifts and Chinese masks and little elephants. And I was like, it's kind of weird. You like us too much, but oh well. Then we left. Uh, Emily and Gunnar went back on a later trip. They took a team the next year, uh, interacted with Rebecca again in 2015. And then I think they moved there in 2016. Is that the right year, 2017? 2017, they moved there. Rebecca is still around. Rebecca starts to come over to their house for lunch, come over to their house for dinner. Uh, and so I talked to Emily and Gunnar about this. They have literally had 40 conversations with Rebecca about Jesus in the last five years. And I believe that's true because I've been a part of some of them. Kirsten's been a part of some of them. Morgan's been a part of some of them just talking to her. And she's been just, ah, I'm not sure if I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not sure. But then it all comes to a head point a couple weeks ago. Preston Gunner and Emily are sitting down for coffee with Rebecca. And she starts to share that her uh, a family member had passed away. 
And this is what she shared. Get this. Because they've been taught, they're very honest with her that they're missionaries in China. They're here to tell people about Jesus. And so she says, when her uncle died, she was sad that she couldn't tell her family about Jesus and the hope they could have to go to heaven because she herself hadn't given her life to Jesus yet. So you got to know me, Preston, you're like, uh, well, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And she, she starts to say she doesn't know because she doesn't know what it would look like. And so Gunner, and I know Gunner, I love Gunner, he literally did this. He started to say, well, it looks like surrender. And he literally, every time he said the word surrender, he just lifted his hands in the air. He's like, Rebecca, you just have to surrender. And she's like, but I have to be like in a church building. And he's like, no, you just surrender. And so, guys, she literally gets up walks outside of the coffee shop and in her own words on the street in China, lifts her hands and says, Jesus, I surrender to you. So Emily Gunner and Preston get on their knees. They have a spontaneous worship session on a street in China where it's quite illegal to do all of these things. They go and baptize her in the river by her house. And she's been strategizing with them about what it's going to look like to see her family come to Jesus. Friends, if we're saved, we have an assignment. Salvation is not just attending church. It's not just believing the right things, saying the right things. There's a call on us to be ambassadors for Christ. Let's stand together. I just want to invite the prayer team to come forward and line the front. Um, we, I think we're going to have a lot of prayer needs today, so I want to invite also, especially youth leaders um, to come down to the front. Thank you, Lord. Can we just close our eyes all across the room? Maybe even put our hands out. Like we're going to receive a gift. We're just going to spend a few minutes here responding to the voice of the Lord. And then we're going to go. Don't worry, it won't take too long. But Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence to fill this place. Thank you for your sweet presence. Can you just say that? Just pray that under your breath. Just say, Holy Spirit, help me be aware of your presence in this room. Yeah, thank you for your freedom, God. Here's what I want to do. A way to simplify the word salvation could just mean freedom. Freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And what I sense right now is the Holy Spirit is kind of walking across this room, moving across this room, and there's some hearts that he wants to bring freedom to. There's some people in this room that have felt trapped in prison, in cages, of addiction, trapped in cages of depression and anxiety and fear. And this morning, I see Jesus walking up to those cages to unlock the prison doors. So why don't you just, with eyes closed across the room, just kind of ask yourself the question, what's the area in my heart that I need freedom in? And some of us can thank areas in the past where we've experienced freedom. Some of us, um, I want this to even be an opportunity to receive a call to bring freedom to an area of society. Uh, but, but I really sense right now there's a ministry opportunity um, for us to deal with some areas we still don't feel free in our hearts. So Holy Spirit, highlight that to us. What are the areas in hearts in this room where there's still bondage, still chains?